tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is intended for mature audiences and may contain strong language, adult themes, and content of a violent and sexual nature which may not be appropriate for everyone. Welcome, listener to the horror hill. If it's the darkness you seek, you won't be disappointed. I'm your host, Jason Hill, and it's time for our appointment. In this place, there is no sun, and nightmares do come true. Here, instead of shadow falling, the shadows follow you. Consider getting comfortable before the air grows colder. Prepare yourself if you dare. Come inch a little closer. If darkness is what you're after, seek no more your searches through. You haven't found the darkness, traveler. The darkness has found you. Good evening. You're listening to Horror Hill. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 14. I'm your host, Jason Hill, and I'm thrilled you could join me tonight. In today's episode, we bring you two gut-wrenching tales from authors Sorin Narnia and Laird Baron about cursed conscripts, morbid mercenaries, and benighted battalions marching to certain death. Or worse. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, as well as hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today to get instant access from our friends at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Thank you for your support. Now, allow me to escort you to a place where the sun dies and nightmares come to life, where those who seek the darkness need look no further. Welcome, listener, to the Horror Hill. You haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. For our first story, we follow in the forsaken footsteps of an armed host, marching ever away from safety, and ever closer to terror. Without further ado, from author Sauron Narnia, I give you... Army. My name is Solomon Tal. On the 27th moon of the Year of the Shining Cloud, I awoke in our encampment with a terrible feeling. For five days we'd been without motion in any direction, waiting. Waiting for the knights to give us the order to move east, but it had not come. And so our days had been spent sharpening our pikes and shaving our arrow points, and at night there were songs and stories as we hoped and prayed a miracle would come for us. But that morning, which was gray and foggy, I sensed a stirring among the men, and one by one they woke up, and we could see fire on the horizon. And then, here they came, a thousand men, marching and on horseback, and when I saw them come over the hill, I put my head in my hands and told myself that I was not certainly dead. I could not know that this was the end. But every man in camp despaired, 
especially when we saw that more and more armies joined the first, until in the end there were thousands spread out around us, and we had to move from Red Royale because there was no room in its fields for us all. The armies carried themselves with dignity, but the fear was etched in their faces, even on the faces of the knights. Preparations were begun to march, orders were shouted, and we were aligned in columns. It took hours. All fires were crushed, the wagons were loaded with supplies, the tents struck down. Harrick, my only friend who I now clung to for his bravery so that I would not go mad, told me he guessed our journey overland would only be of a single day. This, he said he could tell by the amount of supplies we left behind for the wolves. One day. That meant we were all headed for the shore. And though we were not prepared to inquire about our destination and no one was telling us anything, our fates were sealed. We started to move at midday, more than 4,000 soldiers moving through the mud. The fog did not let up. Word came to the ranks that more than a dozen men had not moved from camp. They'd simply stayed and asked to be executed. Rumor held that their wishes had been quickly granted. Stieg, a pikeman, told me he had seen it happen. There had been humor, even when marching toward the Battle of the Cliffs of Shand, but now there was none for not a single man believed he would live through what we were to face. The nights were excessively harsh when a man fell out of line or a wagon slowed, and they tolerated no speech that they could hear. They barked and shouted orders and we followed them, our heads down. Toward the beginning of dusk I heard a man sobbing to my left and I turned and I saw a young spearman who had broken down, and yet his step did not slow. And I saw a man who walked forward even as his face had turned a sickly white, gazing forward with eyes as dead as any I had ever seen. It was as if he had accepted his fate so readily that he was willing himself to become hollow. At night, when we expected to rest, we did not rest. Torches were lit and we entered the Enkelid forest. We could see figures human figures watching us at a safe distance. These were the woods people, but they may as well have been the angels of death. Later, I would see a man and a woman standing close enough that I could make out their faces by the light of a torch. They had faces like stone idols, without emotion or sympathy. There was no food for us. We walked all night through the cold, what did the knights care, after all, if we starved? I heard men fall, but I didn't look back. By dawn of the next day, I was almost delirious with exhaustion. Just as light came, the order came down for us to slow our movement. We had broken through the woods an hour before, and a quarter of an hour after that, the knights suddenly galloped ahead, and we saw the sea. Eight great warships awaited for us. We ceased movement and then began the process of loading the armies onto them. It was more waiting, but now at least we were allowed to rest, and soup and bread came down the lines. Just enough to keep us conscious. The knights sent guards through the assignments and the armies began to separate from each other. There would be sleep on board, we were told. More than anything, I did not want to be separated from Herrick. I stayed close to him. He cursed the disorganization of the knights under his breath. But something was wrong with him. He clutched his stomach as he spoke. It took more than two hours of interminable shuffling and shifting to get us onto the boats. It was far colder than it had been the day before. The knights didn't even care about the low murmur that went through the armies. We could see when we got close to them that even though they had been on horseback and not nearly as punished physically, they too were red-eyed and scared. We moved inch by inch across the gangplank, 
sometimes stopping, and I was less than twenty yards from the mouth of the gateway when something thudded beside me. I looked down and a man had collapsed almost at my feet. It was Herrick. I reached down and so did the man beside me. Herrick's face was locked in a scream, but no sound emerged. He lay on his side, not moving. A guard came through and hovered over him and then pushed me out of the way as I shook Herrick desperately. He's died, the guard said very softly. He's died. It had not been an ordinary death. His face told us so. It had been fear. The guard in one of the nights stayed with Herrick while urging us to move. It was Stieg who kept me from collapsing myself, pushing me on. He and I both cried then. We were no longer ashamed. And we were not the only ones. I looked back and saw Herrick being carried back to shore, and he disappeared from my view, blotted out by the soldiers all around me. On the ship I lay sprawled across the wooden supports, able to sleep only fitfully. More meaningless hours went by as we waited for the boat to leave the shore. It would be the last time we would ever touch our homeland. The men took their places and we were left alone, the knights and guards collecting up on the deck to begin their planning. This would not be a mere attack. It would be an invasion. There were no more warships to come. Every available man had been called to fight this enemy. Without our overseers watching, there was more talk and counsel delivered to the weakest of us even as most passed out with exhaustion. I remained almost silent. There was more stirring when the cooks came through with more soup, and even meat and sugared tea. That night, I sometimes heard a splash, which I would learn at dawn had been the sound of men throwing themselves from the brig. The freezing water represented a most merciful death. I was aware of four of these suicides. These men were unobstructed in their goal. I saw in the middle of the night a long swordsman of my acquaintance staring silently through one of the portholes. I made my way over to him, desperate for human contact, even if it was utterly wordless. He and I exchanged a glance, and nothing more. Our ship was on the far left of the formation of the fleet, and all I could see at first was the open ocean. Within minutes, though, I saw the shape out there on the water, a vessel sailing in the opposite direction, toward Red Rael. It was a great carrick. The long swordsman, seeing it in real detail before I could, invoked the gods in a bloodless whisper, for there was no one on that ship. It drifted without aim across the water pushed off from somewhere miles and miles away, and our own boat was now turning away from it, toward the north, in an effort to avoid striking it. It passed close enough that we could hear the creaking of its masts. This invaluable vessel had no crew, no captain, no armies. They had been left on Alberiag to die, and none had returned. This was the ship whose soldiers we had been waiting for in the encampment back in Karim. When it had never come, the decision had been made to merge as many armies as possible and mount the invasion. I could feel men behind us peering out into the night, watching the boat move past on its way to its natural end. It transported not even the bodies of the dead. Shortly after the sun rose, I saw that its color was not as it should have been. There was a faint yellow tinge in the sky, and upon seeing this, one of the Calic soldiers began to wail and cry out for the gods to sink our ship in mercy. The rest of us, almost to a man, lapsed into a hypnotized silence as we watched the yellow color become more and more intense until we were sailing into a surreal blanket of warm gold. 
a thick fog of color that drenched every ship. To hold one's hand in front of one's face was to see it lightly bathed in that sickening hue that we had only heard rumor of. Some began to speak of mutiny and desertion, of seizing control of the ship. But soon enough the guards came down from above and Sir Roderick then appeared in the hold. And then he spoke. We are landing on Alberiag. He went on to say that we could, if we wished, write to our loved ones, and our messages would be held on board for the ship's return trip to Ren Royale. Two guards began to pass out parchment and ink. Sir Roderick began to instruct us then, explaining in the driest terms the procedures we were to follow upon disembarking, procedures that we had to follow to absolute precision to save seconds. It would be only a march of two miles to our attack point. The ship would touch the shore of Alberiag in less than six hours. He spoke further of divisional assignments and said there would be no rear guard, no man left on the beach. For four of those six hours, the idiot cleric Christide led us in a mass that he pushed ever onward, his voice becoming hoarse, having to stop for water dozens of times as he spoke every word he could from the Book of the Sun. Finally, he could simply speak no more. For the last two hours before we landed, men lay on their planks staring at the ceiling above them, or paced back and forth, muttering to themselves, or simply sat with heads and hands, or, like me, prayed. The sky above the sea was drenched in a thick amber glow as if the sun had caught fire and was dying. Sometimes the sky would seem to flicker as if lightning were trying to press through from another realm. Night and day had no meaning here, as since the summer of the previous year, that sky had remained constant over Alberiag through every hour. Sixty minutes out from shore, we began to hear a sound we'd never known existed. There had been no tales of it. One had to listen close in the beginning to hear it over the waves. It was the sound of a thousand, perhaps ten thousand creatures. Not humans. More like animals. Baying animals who had congregated and were now emitting a common cry of excitement and anger. It rose slowly all around us, and by the time land came into view to the north, every man was hearing it, and every man, including Sir Roderick, had gone quiet, listening to this awful cacophony, which was constant and unyielding. We began to see through the amber cloak the features of the undefended shore so much like our own back home. Sir Roderick commanded us to begin to maneuver into the optimum position for a swift disembarkation, which meant pressing against each other near the keel. Four lancers began to frantically ready the gangplank for opening. We weighed in so tight against each other that it was difficult to breathe. We had to hope that the steersmen would not cause such an abrupt landing that the contact would crush the men in the first ranks. My breath came shorter and shorter as we heard the bottom of the boat scrape the shoals. And then we had landed. A messenger lad shouted out and the gangway began to lower, allowing the diseased light to flood in. No one hesitated to exit the hold that had held us captive, even though the sound of that cloud of dissenting angry voices became much louder when the cold air struck us. We lined up on the shore having very little room to maneuver, shoved this way and that by the momentum of whichever soldier moved to one's left and right. The horses, the dogs, and the weapons were offloaded from one of the ships with great speed. It was obvious to me that things were moving much more swiftly than had been planned. The knights must have sensed the new panic among us that the mysterious outcry was causing. When all of the men were off the boats, the lines that formed in order to move quickly toward the weapon caches came together fast. The knights had to shout louder and louder to get their words through to us, and many of the men seemed to have stopped responding, their movements becoming as slurred as their speech when drunk. I was handed a halberd and immediately was urged to start to march. 
As for sticking to the formations described to us on the ship, this plan seemed to have been abandoned. We were to simply go forward, as quickly as we could. The soldiers began to march. I knew no one anymore. The faces were all unfamiliar. We reached grass. A wide field was stretching away from us, but the grass was dead and withered. The tumult of buzzing voices was getting louder and louder, coming from just up ahead. A man on my left dropped his blade, and when he reached down for it, he stayed on his knees, and then curled on the cold ground as if wishing to sleep, like a little boy, and no one stopped him. Another man dropped to the ground, having lost his footing, and he made a half-attempt to rise, but from the despair etched on his face I knew that he would not get up again, and his eyes closed, and he collapsed right there, like a doll. The knights were shouting orders over the din to stop for nothing when we were engaged. The healers had all been issued weapons as well, so there would be no medicines or treatments for the fallen. On a certain call, they abandoned their horses, leaping from them, and raised their blades, and at the top of the hill their shouts became full-throated, red-faced cries, their sound utterly lost beneath the enemies. Now, our visibility had been cut to just a few hundred yards with the intensity of the amber fog. Over the hill, just up ahead, was the fissure. A crack in the earth more than a mile wide, with a mouth twenty feet high. Inside it, utter darkness. Now torches were rapidly lit all around, including mine, as a boy of no more than fourteen anointed my free hand with flame. I was out in front. I would be among the first hundred men in, even in front of the mercenary ranks. The cry was put forth to run, and the knights, the bravest among us, not hesitating from their duty to lead the charge, began to rush forward toward the fissure. I ran. The footing beneath me was firm. I could see, reflected off the roof of the fissure, a flicker of light. And then another. And another. The enemy was emerging with their own burning torches. We entered the terrible pit as one rampaging, undisciplined mass. I cannot say where the divide truly was between earth and hell, but as soon as my voice gave out and my eardrums began to shake with the force of the enemy's echoing, collective scream, a face appeared in the dark. The face of a being that was not meant for even a single step outside of the abyss. It had once been a man, or something's imagining of one. But there was no clothing on its body, and its bones were only half protected by human flesh. A skeletal beast, two feet taller than I, no eyes, and an enormous skull that was hideously bovine. It had not hands but claws, a filthy sword gripped in one, a torch gripped in the other, and its jaws opened and closed many times in a single second, like a machine come to life. And before I could even raise my own weapon to strike it, thousands upon thousands of like-bodied atrocities became visible far beyond this one. And in the rank and fetid shadows, as their torches broke the darkness, and their counter-invasion began. This episode of Horror Hill is brought to you by Shudder, a premium video service brought to you by AMC Networks, offering an unbeatable selection of expertly curated horror, with exclusive and original titles you won't find anywhere else uncut and commercial free for only $5.99 a month or $56.99 a year. Widely considered to be the Netflix of horror, Shudder has the largest, fastest growing human curated selection of thrilling and dangerous horror entertainment, easily streamed ad free on any number of video platforms including iOS and Android devices, with all new spine-tingling thrillers, shocking horrors, 
and truly edge of your seat suspense added weekly. I personally love Shudder and have been streaming it from my Apple TV for years now, and with the eclectic and expertly curated selection, I sometimes feel like Shudder was made just for me. With some of my old favorites on there, like Return of the Living Dead, a horror comedy or comedy horror. It's kind of hard to pigeonhole Return of the Living Dead. Just check it out. If you like practical effects, man, you will be impressed. Or 2014 Spring, which is, well, it's if Before Sunrise was written by H.P. Lovecraft. I kid you not. And very recently added, something I'm very excited about that I have not gotten around to watching yet, Hell Comes to Frogtown, starring WWF superstar Rowdy Roddy Piper. Just type in Hell Comes to Frogtown and check out some screenshots. I, ugh, I can't wait. Shudder is maybe the only video service that I think of that I feel like actually treats me with respect and cares about my tastes. So what are you waiting for? Get started streaming the best horror, thriller, and supernatural content. Shudder's expertly curated collection includes titles like the acclaimed Tigers Are Not Afraid, One Cut of the Dead, Revenge, and the Creepshow TV series, produced by Greg Nicotero and based on the famous films of George Romero. To try Shudder free for 30 days, go to Shudder.com and use promo code HILL. That's S-H-U-D-D-E-R.com and use promo code HILL. Thank you for your support of this program and of the sponsors that make it possible. You've been listening to Army by author Sarin Narnia. It seems that on the horror hill, when you stare into the abyss, sometimes the abyss comes out to play. Did that last story slake your appetite for blood? I didn't think so. Then stretch out nice and comfortably, and be sure to loosen your belt, because on the horror hill, the feast never ends. For our next cautionary tale, we will delve again into the unhallowed grounds of epic dark fantasy, and follow another fabled foot soldier to a desecrated cavern, where he discovers that in the primordial dark, breaking a few eggs can award one more than an omelet. So, open wide, and Try to breathe through your nose. <laughs> From author Laird Barron, I give you a clutch. The man in the straw bed was done for, for sure. The young woman saw it plainly in his knotted muscles, heard it in his wet and ragged coughs. Moss lung, the wise women called the malady. Woodcutters such as her uncle risked it by hewing into fungi encrusted cedars and firs. He gleamed with sweat. Three white hens clucked and fluffed themselves on the rack near his naked feet. The dog grumbled by the hearth, lost in a dream of the hunt. I'm dying, her uncle said. I'm near. You took me in and gave me shelter, <clears throat> allowed me to call you daughter. You are a precious ornament to my worthless life. Oh, sweet fair one, scrubber of pots, burner of suppers, nurse to wounded forest creatures, radiant of heart and pure virtue. He relapsed, head lolling. The woman ignored him until she finished stoking the fire. She gathered her skirts and came to kneel at his side. She laid her hand upon his brow. Hot as a skillet, it would not be long. Death wetted his culling knife out in the night gloom, ready to cut another soul off at the knees. She uncorked a bottle of whiskey and dribbled it over the man's scabrous lips until he gagged. 
My parents are dead these nine years. You have stood in their place. You have cut the wood and killed the wolves. You are my father's blood returned home at our darkest hour. Oh, uncle. Of course you may call me daughter. Uncle. Yes. Uncle. <laughs> that was a story. The man tucked her sleeve. She seemed to gather her innermost reserves for his expression smoothed, and he spoke with a cold, uncharacteristic serenity. The moon will roll like the bloody hub of a chariot through the branches of the crying sycamores. On nights such as this, when the wind roars, and the hearth coals glow like the eyes of the black dog itself, you... <coughs> And the whiskey are a comfort. The cottage seems so rude, the candle glow of our souls so feeble. Yet from your cheerful me and I draw courage. You resemble so much your mother now. O oh, creator, rest her. Gazing upon the accumulated trinkets, my bitten axes, the salted venison, the burlap and the barrels, storm chests and sealed urns, and the painting of your mother in her maidenhood. I am struck by how little there is to show for the generations of labor, for the missing thumb, the broken back, the lungs infested with devil's club spore, my drunkard's breath rasping, slower and slower. You're a good girl. Alas, I must tell you something, nevertheless. My deathbed confession. Before you came along, I swore I'd be crisped in the fires of hell rather than sire offspring. You are dearer to my heart than any golden treasure. I should have kept my word. Sired offspring, she said. I don't take your meaning. Oh, I fear that will come to you. When I was young, the Emperor's Highway ended a few leagues south of the Black Forest. Not like today, where the road cleaves right through the middle and is lined with hostels and cheery inns. Thanks to the many reforms of the Empress, create her bless and keep her from harm. No. In the olden times, all you got were deer paths and howling darkness once you set foot off the porch. Men hunted in groups with flintlocks and spears and packs of hounds. Boar, bear, wolf, and worse lurked. Even a few of the trees and some of the mossy boulders couldn't be trusted. Vile spirits were loose in the world. Hapless travelers vanished, burly hunters too. The children, and what mothered everyone the most. Ours has ever been a family of foresters. Hunters, trappers, fellers, every man. My great-great-great-grandfather, Abernathy Rourke, settled right here, on the southern verge of the forest. Just after the shouting ended over the botched succession of King Theobald, Abernathy and his kin were a bound of scufflaws and partisans who fled north when the revolt went sour. But half the kingdoms were in the same pickle, and a couple generations later all was forgiven, if not forgotten. Most of the wood folk returned to the cities once the interregnum ended. The Rourkes stood fast and continued to carve a living from the banded oak and red walnut that southern lords and fat-bellied merchants hold so dear. We hunted the razorback boars and skinned the bears that speak the tongue of men. We will continue until the last of us has shuffled into the hinterlands. James Dandy was a friend in my youth. Yes, yes, the very highwayman and brigand who got himself hanged in King's Grove two winters gone. Last of his line. Oh, he grew up hard as nails. 
His parents were put to the axe and his brothers taken in chains to Sad Island. The Cordoy would have bagged him too if he'd not squirreled away beneath a pile of dung until they tramped down to their ships and went back over the sea to their great ruined empire of caverns in Mount Thrall. <laughs> that marked him. Surely it did. Not a bad sort, but not a good one either. Now he's worm food with all the rest, but yours truly. Our misadventures were mainly his doing, or that of his cousin Manfred Hurt and Ike Lutz, both of whom had fled Westhold under a dark cloud. Manhors, the pair. Hurt convinced me to leave home and travel the kingdom in search of adventure. For a year I followed him around like a puppy, growing leaner and meaner with each passing week. We survived by laboring when there was labor, stealing pies from windowsills, whoring ourselves to moneyed folk, and, and so forth. I learned much of Dandy and his cousins. Much indeed. I'd resigned myself to another dose of boot leather soup when Dandy waved a handbill he'd snagged from the gutter. He proposed that we four should join a troop of other stout lads and answer the king's call for a march into the worst part of the Black Forest. The Fells. Aye, the Fells. The Fells where the Jumping Jack dwells. The Ministry of Coin wanted to scour the ruins of them old fallen holes that lie sunk into the muck and mire. There's been a war, always a war, and to drain the treasury. Matters were so dire, palace servants had taken to melting royal dinnerware for the gold. <laughs> Shameful. Idweird Minji sat the throne in those days. King Minji's mother died birthing him when he was raised by a witch from the Far East. The bat gave him a taste for the black arts. Maybe a... Yen for the dark itself. What a wretched court his must have been. Damned if that warlock John Foot didn't curry his favor all the years Minji reigned. John Foot's folly is why I'll never step north of the Hunt River so long as I draw breath. Creator, blast him. After a roaring drunk, my friends and I got fresh tattoos and signed up with the Royal Army. They were pleased to snatch our service since we were accomplished woodsmen, or close enough for their uses. I hoped to see home again. Foolish boy was I. Away we went, a full company of soldiers, laborers, potboys, and whores. One of a dozen such companies sent to spelunk for gold and precious relics and jewelry in the abandoned strongholds of the dead lords. Whispers were that the leaders of the expeditions reported not to the Chancellery, but to Foot himself. He sought something other than mere gold or trinkets among the ruins. Woe to us who discovered it for him. We marched, north and north, through the tilled and green lands around Great Port, north and north over the tomb water and through the Wolverine Mountains a day's ride from the sea, north and north again, until we passed through Stirling, and entered the Black Forest in the region known as Cottonwood Vale, for the cottonwood trees that line the river fetch. Our troop was led by Captain Vanger, well known throughout the army as a genuine hard-ass. Vanger the Incorruptible. Vanger the Whip. Captain brooked no nonsense among the ranks, soldier or civilian. Carried a black snake whip at his belt, as the men all do in Carlsbad, which is where he'd been brought bloody and screaming into this evil world. Loved that whip, Vanger did. Could snap a fly off a man's cheek at seven paces. Nobody was safe from it either. That's how Manfred Hurt lost a chunk of his earlobe. Old Incorruptible popped it like a cherry over some trifling infraction, or because he didn't care for the look on the lad's face. No, 
It didn't teach her much except to use a bit more stealth when fucking about. Only a bit. North and north. Five days along the left-hand path with a canopy closes like an iron trap and sunbeams a one. That way cannot be found anymore. It's overgrown, and some sprats argue it only exists in the addled minds of old men. Sprats with fewer teeth than before they say to me, I have her. Our scouts, a squad of Palaki warriors who wore top knots and red ochre war paint, had their chores cut out for them. You think our homely shack lies in the wilds now, do you? Back then, the left hand was the only trail, except what the animals made. Before the grand massacres that exterminated them once and for all, mallets and hillmen skulked from the moors and hunted the forest. Not for game, mind you. Plenty of that in the highlands. The savages collected scalps from unwary southerners they caught with their britches at half-mast. None of us snot noses had seen a genuine blue belly, and despite the grim mutters among the veterans, we eagerly hoped to catch a glimpse. Some shit-eating fairy always lurks in the wings, waiting to grant an errant wish. Horses and donkeys went missing. The troll spotted malevolent shadows flitting among the wagons and drove them away with torches and shouts. Finally, the Millettes captured two lads on graveyard watch, snatched those unlucky boys smooth and quiet as weasels in the coop. Captain Vanger forbade any rescue mission into the deep undergrowth. He'd fought in the Battle of Thornwood, and a dozen more on the Yindi subcontinent where tigers and their cults of warship roamed the jungles. He knew the score. We marched onward and dusk came in a rich crimson blush through the foliage. Dieter Johansson and Marvin of Saltlek. Those were their names. Healthy boys with good, strong lungs. The boy's screams echoed for two nights. Still echo in my mind sometimes. Three more days northwest and we forded the river Hunt and soon came upon a marsh of pale moss. Across this bog spanned a rough path of rotted planks. Here lay the beginning of the fells. The savages harried us no more. Even they were wise enough to stay clear of that cursed land with its toads, spiders, and poison clouds from the fifty years' fires. The trail crisscrossed the fells like veins in the back of a crone's hand. Some called those paths the Grey Fingers, others the Long Trail Winding. They branched every which way, and as far as I know, wound on forever. Nobody can say who slapped them down in the first place. Perhaps it was the ancient kings or surveyors from the time of Argiad of Anathia, or his usurper son. What I do know is the horses and donkeys hated them. The soldiers hated them too, but to step off the planks was short death. The mud had no bottom and would suck a man straight down to hell. More days of stumble and slog. Mosquitoes blacked the nets at night. Bloodsuckers droned so loud you couldn't hear the comrades snoring at your shoulder. Everybody had the shits. Lost four men and an entire string of horses to the bog water. Autumn north of the Wolverine Mountains is dreary. Rain, muck, and leeches are what you're in for. Our camps became restless as the priests argued with the officers on the matter of performing rites sacred to the season. The men were not particularly thrilled that the Feast of the Dead fell upon us as we journeyed across a land laid low by sorcery. We feared to offend the powers, yet we dreaded to commence ceremonies that by necessity draw the attention of the dark. Captain Vanger compromised my doubling wine rations and permitting the chaplain to affright us with gruesome tales of how the inhabitants of the region had all gotten themselves exterminated. The chaplain painted with broad strokes. The men were bumpkins, and nitty-gritty details would have been wasted. 
On the next-to-last evening of autumn, the army camped atop a butte that heaved from the quagmire. West lay the ruins of Castle Warrant. Warrant's towers had crumbled, and pieces of carved granite were embedded in the slope of the ridge it occupied. The vision of that night remains. Campfires encircled the crown of our bluff, smoke rising into the grin of the skull moon. Shattered battlements of the castle silhouetted against stars, smashed so densely close together, they formed bands of white and pink and smearing red. Jellied cold of the dark between the stars seeped across the void and stole my breath. I slept little. At dawn, the soldiers dug earthworks. Captain Vanger hadn't lived to earn silver in his whiskers by playing the fool. No guarantee the bluebellies wouldn't return in force, or that the giant troglodytes of the deep swamp wouldn't boil forth to ravish the men and slaughter the animals. We civvies were divided into small parties overseen by squads of light infantry and dispatched along vectors of approach. Manfred Hurt and me were sent to a breach in the southern curtain wall. Dandy and Lutz got sent elsewhere with other laborers. I never saw Lutz again. He fell into a crevice. <laughs> Plop. With picks, axes, and pry bars, we spent the hours until dusk chopping through thickets and rolling aside boulders to reach the outer courtyard. Mossy walls loomed overhead. Hurt asked me if I knew of the warrants and why their castle was so damnably massive. It went against my grain to admit any sort of book learning to the oafs of my acquaintance. Thus, I broke wind and shrugged. Da had taught me to play close to the chest. On the other hand, my ma had taught me to read. Semi-educated lady that she'd been before her logger love swept her away from civilization. I could have instructed my chum that this fortress had once held the northwest marches against the Nord. Those fathers of mallets and greethungs. And the Pelaki, indeed, a hundred other tribes that fell to barbarism when the great empire across the sea receded into itself. They called her Castle Warrant. Yet, she'd served as the steading of many a noble family until the Belfors lost her during the Interregnum. I could have also mentioned the rumors of madness and depravity that possessed the Balfour family decades before the wars. My grandmother waited in the famed historian Grote of Ligos, and she read over his shoulder when he recorded the Red Treatise of Diebold in the north. She'd muttered of bloody orgies and foul sacraments that occurred in many of the north holds of a certain era. A vile cult infiltrated the ranks of the noble families, corrupting those fair knights to the ways of evil and ultimately destroying them from within. Traffickers with the dark, Graham said of the cultists. Were she yet living, she would not have approved of our traipsing about the ruined estates of those who perished in the thrall of wormy perversions. No way could I speak any of this to loutish hurt. He cursed the crown in one breath and praised it with the next. Over a supper of boiled oats and salted pork, a strapping blacksmith's son named Henry Bain gripped my shoulder in his ham hock fist. Don't go back in the morn, he says to me. I ask why not, and he says he beheld a crow peck the eye from a dying mule. The crow winged through the mist toward the western tower. Henry Bain took it for an ill omen. Something right terrible will happen tomorrow. He warned. Fuck me running if that Claude wasn't dead right. The horror acted on a delay. It fastened upon me. I... I finally understood in the fullness of time and all that. More and more, every night, when I lie awake and listen to branches scratch the roof. The courtyard sod had grown brittle. 
A royal engineer marked a spot and we yoked a team of mules to an auger and bored until we punched a hole into a vault. Me and a score of other lads descended in a series of lines knotted together. Down and down. Into the bowels of the earth with our picks and our lamps. Hearts pitter patting in our throats. We knew what to search for. Coffers of jewelry and objects of art. Precious coins, tarnished or bright. Ceremonial blades begrimed by rust and verdigris and panoplies of ancestral armor. A grand cavern spread beneath the foundations of Castle Warrant. Stalactites oozed primordial slime. Shelves of granite and quartz blazed in the torchlight and fell away into utter blackness. A river clashed over distant rocks. Colonies of bats shrilled as they funneled into the abyss. Echoes traveled for leagues. Our party unhooked from the belays and clung to the damp spine of bedrock, followed its curve around to a landing and came to a flight of steps carved from the very stone itself. One case spiraled downward into the heart of the earth. The second case corkscrewed upward into the ruins of the castle proper. Our party split. I ventured up with nine comrades while only feeling to watch the torches of our other fellows sink and dwindle to specks floating in oil, then snuffed. In case you're wondering, we never saw them again either. Hurd and I took point. We climbed. Three hundred steps. Cracks every which way. Deep cracks stuffed with millipedes and pill bugs and wet, cancerous moss. It smelled worse than the stuff in the swamp. Clung to our boots and squelched like mud, as did the pale mushrooms in their beds of hollowed step and splintered masonry. Earthquakes had tumbled stones from the vaulted roof. We scrambled over them, or went around, climbing, climbing, until at last we traveled through an archway into the basement. Mind you, Castle Warren stood for a millennium before the interregnum, Emperor Innocent II himself ordered it built. As one of the great keeps of the north, Warrant contained smithies and barracks, and stables to house the lancers of diluted Zetstock, who rode war horses imported from the west. And dungeons. Many, many cells, many chambers of interrogation and woe. The rock was a honeycomb, full of bones. An ossuary of damned souls. None of the prisoners of war were released during the final days before the fires. Men packed into cubby holes were left to gnaw one another like starved rats. Their skeletons moldered, locked in the eternal struggle. Oh, how we tiptoed past the bones, our shadows tall and cruelly sharp, capered and spelled across the walls mocking us. Grown men, with daggers and swords. We huddled together and held hands like children passing through that crypt. Halls crisped and crossed and doubled upon themselves. Sergeant Barker broke out the chalk so he wouldn't become lost forever in the warren. The stairwell to the main floor had collapsed, confining our search for riches to those lower levels. I filled a burlap bag with coins, brass, bronze, copper, reliefs worn smooth and shined to a glow I could see in the near dark. I swept all kinds of bullshit into that sack with a chance it would fetch a kind word from the captain, or at least spare me from the lash. Pewter cups and pewter plates, mostly cracked, but who gave a rip? Metal tongs and shattered candlesticks. Hurt rejoiced to find a trunk he thought would be jammed with valuables. Alas, mostly dirt and moldering cloth. He saved a moth-eaten tapestry that had grayed with antiquity. Smoke hung in the fumy haze of our torch. More slimy lichen covered the walls. More slimy white mushrooms puffed beneath our tread. My breath huffed forth, and I sucked it and the torch smoke 
and the pall of the mushrooms in again, and my thoughts revolved around themselves, and my mood lightened, even as a tear of desperation leaked from my eye. Intoxicated, dear daughter. No matter the source. <laughs> it's one way to pass the time in hell, should you ever need to know. Hurt and I struck it rich in a dead-end passage. I leaned against the wall to rest my sore backside. The stone crumbled and sloughed away, and there, in a queerly shaped cell, were two dozen obsidian eggs stacked within the remnants of rotted crates. I had seen their like once at a jeweler's shop in Victory City, hollow for the placing of a gem or prayer scroll, while others contained several smaller versions, each nested within its kin. Richies collected them in sets of fanciful design, and jewelers crafted them in a drover's dozen lands. I lifted one and turned it over. Different from the fabricated pieces I'd encountered, yet similar enough to give me hope of high value. Hard and edgy as the obsidian it resembled, and seamless as any true egg. Something inside rattled the way a musician's gourd rattles. Why in the hell they got no latches? Hurt said the way a child will of a sulfist upon discovering there's no gifts on the breakfast platter. Surely the exotic nature of the eggs would fetch a fair coin. We'd get double rations at camp, and that pleased me well enough to clear my foggy brain. I admit to a larcenous nature. Knowing well that Hurt was too dumb to count, I socked away three of the eggs with the intention of smuggling them back to civilization and brokering a fortune of my own. Hurt gathered our comrades while I set about fashioning a travoy to transport the other goods we'd gathered. Soon, the others arrived, bearing their own dubious treasures. We stowed our spoils and proceeded for the surface. A train of scout ants dutifully transporting crumbs back to the colony. Somehow, and maybe the brain fog returned to beleaguer me, I lost the way. I had taken the hind teat of our column as I dragged a carpet load of junk treasure and no one wanted to trip over it in the gloom. One moment, Hurt trudged a couple paces ahead, and then I stubbed my toe on a loose stone and the men went around the corner. Gone. Grunts and laughter and curses quit upon an instant as did the glare of their lamps and torches. The sudden stillness sobered me right smartly. I shouted to them. My voice echoed through the labyrinth. It didn't rebound. It kept on going without answer. Then I felt in my pocket for flint and in moments ignited a brand from a sconce. A feeble reddish hue flickered from that ancient pitch. Nowhere did I spy Sergeant Bocker's chalk marks. I thought of all those skeletons in their cells and the weight of the rock overhead, and of the mold and slime oozing in the cracks. Somewhere, wind moaned through a crevice. Dread coiled around me, sure as the noxious smoke. Hold still, young Rock, someone whispered from the shadows. Hold still, child. I am almost with you. My father's gruff voice, though he died several winters before, crushed beneath the felled trunk of an oak. Later I became convinced it was my imagination. But in the moment... Then, coldly eager whisper was enough to get me moving. I abandoned the load and set forth with alacrity. The hall wound this way and that and tightened until rudely carved rock dug into my shoulders. I squeezed through and stumbled into a cavern. Saints know how big. Couldn't see far as the brand smoldered to a nub. Earth crumbled away from the toes of my boots into a pit. A foul breeze moaned up from that abyss and snuffed the dying flame. Sapped for fight, I curled into a ball and fell asleep right there on the lip of oblivion. Chill and damp woke me. 
didn't know what else to do, so I crawled. Crawled, because I dared not risk tripping into sudden doom. I rested often, so thirsty I sucked at water seeping through rock, so hungry I licked the salty blood from my scabs, so weary I'd slip into dreams of the home cottage and mother's honey porridge before the miserable cold roused me and I crept onward. Without direction or hope, the hunger became terrible. I sorted through my pockets, mad for the smallest crumb, and came across three of the obsidian eggs I had stuffed in there and forgotten. I nearly pitched them away until something stayed my hand. Strangely, the jagged edges had smoothed and softened as unfired clay does over time. The shell curved, pliable as leather as I caressed it. In a daze, I obeyed a mindless command and cracked the egg and took its clabbered bounty in a gulp. The darkness was complete. Thus, I couldn't discern what yoky, blood-warm mass sludged down my throat, or what fine bones and bits crunched between my teeth. The taste of it? Horrible. And delightful. The rancid ambrosia smoldered in my guts. The next two went down the hatch with more ease. I heard my own grunts and gulps echoing from the rocks around me. Horrible. And I licked my fingers on the ground for any drooling trace, and when I'd done, crawled onward. The dark looks after its own. I found a chimney vent and wriggled my way until I popped out on the surface. I wept and rolled in that bog mud. You've seen the scars upon my back. You know how Captain Vanger greeted me upon my return to camp. After twenty lashes at the whipping post, they clapped me in the stocks for a night and chalked it off as a lesson learned. The captain said I reminded him of one of his stupider nephews. I wasn't the only sod who disappeared. Only one who vanished and then came back, though. Vanger ordered the company to withdraw. Apparently he took a gander at the obsidian eggs hurt and the other lads hauled out of the depths and made the call right there. Loose talk spread through the ranks. John Foote wanted the eggs. He sent us into the wilderness for the very purpose of securing them. Gold and gems be damned. Damned. The company made good time on its return journey. The weather stiffened and that sent the bluebellies into their warrens for the cold season. On the eleventh sunset when we camped near the thrush meadows, I went forth to fetch wood for the bonfires. Dreadful pain stabbed through my innards. A foul, sickly sweat oozed from my entire body that made my clothes sodden. Phantasms of delirium cascaded through my mind. I bolted from the work part and squatted behind a log and voided my bowels. Women groan about the agonies of giving birth. Well, lass, they have my profound sympathy. Shite and blood burst from me. I thought myself liable to split apart at the seams, as it were. Miracles and horrors. Three eggs dropped from me and lay in the muddy stench, a clutch of my very own. Each glistened in the muck, roughly the size of a hen's and translucent. Shrimp-like embryos coiled in jelly. I recognized the black wisps of my hair, the imprint of my own coarse features. My own eye gone molten yellow. They flashed with unnatural awareness. Within a few heartbeats, the eggs crusted over, sealed by a jagged black shell. Feral cunning overtook me, reduced me to an animal. 
I scooped handfuls of dirt and dead leaves over the abominations, then slipped back among my comrades who'd made merry at my cries of gastric distress. Life in the Legion is cruel. Nightmares lashed me, as surely as Vanger's whip. I was shorn of rest and sanity, condemned to drift as a voiceless spirit when doppelgangers assumed my life. Brazen, evilly grinning doubles doted upon my dear mother, my friends and colleagues. Each new dawn found me shaking in my bedroll. Only Jim Dandy and Hurt noted my ghastly pale countenance, for I strove mightily to conceal the nature of my ills. The instinct that compelled me to bury the eggs also warned that I lived in the shadow of some obscene, circling terror. Should anyone discover my secret, I would be undone in spectacular fashion. The moral I learned from this experience is always heed your suspicious inner voice. On the seventeenth evening, John Foote himself materialized from the whirling smoke of our main bonfire. The dogs barked with insane fury and then cowered at his sandals. Two sentries pissed themselves. Most depictions of the warlock are exaggerated. Artists render him as a monster. Red eyes, spiked horns, a death's head. Eight feet tall, razor talons, and a lizard's tail. In private, he may strip his costume and resemble exactly thus a demon. However, when I met him, he appeared altogether ordinary. Softening into middle age, his hair receded and his belly rounded, brown of eye and mildly spoken. His black cloak smelt of sulfur, and he smiled too much. He smoked a clay pipe. That was the extent of his nefarious comport. Soldiers vacated a tent at the edge of camp. John Foote quartered within. Shortly thereafter, he summoned, one by one, those of us who'd ventured beneath Castle Warrant. The interviews were brief. Men emerged from their audiences, none the worse for wear. Although none would speak of what had transpired, nor meet the eyes of those who inquired. Vanger's lieutenants roamed among us and boxed the ears of those who pressed the point. Soon enough, the gossip stilled and the men fell into sulky routine. My turn rolled round after midnight. John Foote's tent fumed with smoke from an iron brazier and his pipe. He reclined upon a stone chair carved in the likeness of a centipede rampant. It must resemble the one I am told exists at court in the Privy Council. The warlock took my measure with a long stare. He finished his cigarette and lighted another from the small flames of the brazier. In that lull, I realized the sounds of camp were not muffled by the tent walls. Nay, we inhabited a bubble in a sea of calm darkness. Cozier than my terrifying span trapped at the caverns, and yet much the same. Master Rourke, so good to make your acquaintance. I'm sure this will be the high water mark of my day. He affected the cultured tones of a highborn, his politeness smacked of malice, or perhaps his tepid certainty and unwavering gaze preyed upon my guilt. His demeanor suggested that he knew everything about me all the way back to the rainy morn I dropped from my mama's womb. He laughed and said, Yes, yes, I know much. Much. However, isn't the same as all? I cannot see what happened to you in the dim cellars of Henry Belfour. You were lost, and now you are found. How does this happen? My intent was to mumble an inoffensive lie or three, to deflect and prevaricate as peasantry has treated with the rich since the beginning of time. Foot. Black magician must have cast a gash upon me, for matters took a bizarre turn. I got hungry and I ate three of them fucking eggs you're on about. I listened to myself say, 
Every other muscle in my body froze. I swayed, rooted in place. Damn. Captain Vanger counted the hall. A perfect set, if not for the ones you abandoned. And the ones you devoured. Alas. <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> they hit the spot. Oh, thank you for your honesty, son. John Foote levitated to his feet. Apparently, you met an old friend of mine down there in the cellars. I... Someone else was there, whispering. John Foote nodded wisely. Others sought the clutch. Bad ones. Ethan, Julie V, Carling, Phil Wary, black sorcerers each. It would be no matter to disguise themselves and walk among your comrades, to divide and strike. You were befuddled and cut from the herd. Mere chance delivered you from doom. Did he speak to you? Surely he did. My mouth opened again, though I resisted mightily. I... My father came upon me in the dark. Your dead father? Has a doornail. Mm, this won't do. I'm sorry. He actually did seem a trifle melancholy. Then he took a small skinny knife from his pocket and sliced me from crotch to sternum. I cannot emphasize how disconcerting it is to watch in hapless wonder as the cut is assayed, and one's intestines slop onto hard-packed dirt. What's worse? The warlock crouched, poking through the mess the way priests divine the future from pigeon's entrails. The shock awakened my muscles. I regained sufficient control to stagger backward to the tent flaps. Knife dripping in his hand, John Foote watched me go. Come back here, son. I want to hug the shit out of you. He spread his arms, then grinned. His shadow against the wall coiled most unnaturally, barbed as an iron maiden flung open. Me and my train of guts paid no heed of his imprecation. Three steps took me across the threshold. I collapsed near a cook fire where soldiers just off watch gathered to warm themselves. The last moment I recalled of that particular life were their shouts. Their expressions of panic and disgust. Sweet oblivion swept over me. And I was dead. I revived, blanketed in slimy leaves in the woods behind this very cottage. Naked, bloody, and stinking, but whole. The pink flesh of my belly was without blemish. Its cleaving wound had perfectly healed. They say that home always seems smaller when a man returns. This was the opposite. Trees loomed. The night stretched wider and deeper. Guided by memory and habit, I emerged from the woods and knocked on the door. Ma swooned at the sight of her son, gone nearly two years. More than surprise smote her, more than alarm at my gory visage. Far more, as I discovered upon glimpsing myself in yonder body mirror. Upon departing to seek my fortune in the wide world, I'd attained middling height and shorn my whiskers daily with Dyer's razor. Now my form had reverted to that of a child, of no more than five winters. My face had altered into a somewhat familiar stranger's, partially my grown self, partially a changeling's. Mom would remark later that for several moments she took me for her grandson. Days of confusion followed, my thoughts buzzed. Waking proved difficult to separate from dreaming. I raved of centipede men and eternal darkness. Mother attended me as my strength and wits were gradually restored, and by the end of a week I'd grown fully into my father's old logging clothes. I began to feed myself. I shaved again. She gently inquired what I recalled of the time between my murder and awakening. 
What she wanted to know was if I'd witnessed the afterlife, if I'd gone there and dipped in a toe. I shook my head and claimed ignorance of aught save a smooth, formless void. How could I tell her the truth? I recalled the formless dark. Indeed, I also remembered the licks of fire shooting through its depths, the black rolling back to reveal a deathly white, an iris of bones of men fused together unto eternity. How could I speak to her of the awesome cold, or of the death groans of hidden stars? How could I articulate the sense of folding into myself? Of being trapped inside an egg, drawing sustenance from its yolk, as a chick does. I lacked the courage to describe a vision of rebirth wherein my eggshell cracked in half, and I floated upon a woodland stream near a summer twilight. Willows entangled themselves against a red sky. Other reborn souls rode the current in their shells. They cried to one another, mewling as babes. Bitterns jigged between the reeds, their tarnished bills poised for the killing stroke. The towering birds pecked and stabbed at tiny prey and swallowed piteous shrieks of my fellow travelers. I met the glaring, avaricious eye of fate as it plunged its bill toward me and the red sky cracked as the eggshell had. And tarry black spilled forth instead of light. I drowned in blood, not water. My weary mother deserved a fairer tale, all mothers do. Thus I spun a pretty yarn about warmth and quiet and the peace of the womb. I had changed enough from the son she bore and raised that she had little choice but to accept the lies as one might from a fresh-faced stranger. Wearing a new face and armed with bitter experience, my gift for fabrication was much improved. Despite the uncanniness of the situation, it proved easier for her than I might have suspected. We were able to make a fresh slate of it. As the doldrums evaporated, I realized the starkness of Mom's situation. Since Dad's untimely demise and my departure, she'd become haggard and mournful. Our ancestral hut had gone to rack and ruin. Where had my younger brother Marlon gone? Four summers my junior and a forester in the making, I assumed his absence meant he was afield, cutting wood, or away at the market in King's Grove. Mom covered her face and wept. The gods demanded balance. Three nights before my return, Marlin vanished while logging a nearby hillside. He'd been in the company of fellow woodcutters. They searched for him in vain. The men concluded he'd run afoul of wolves which were particularly ravenous of late. Immediately I dressed in my father's work clothes, gathered meager supplies, and set forth with his bearded axe slung across my back. The hillside wasn't far. I supped with loggers who toiled there. These were men slightly younger than myself alongside whom I'd labored and feasted in days gone by. None recognized my countenance, although each embraced me as a rook, for I bore an unerring stamp of the family bloodline. I introduced myself as a traveling cousin and was thus reborn full and true. Solved my problem with the Legion. The functionaries hate it when folks they've killed turn up alive and well. <laughs> Their foreman told me how Marlin walked into the bushes and vanished. He didn't figure I'd have any better luck turning up a corpse, but God's be with me in my task. I sought my brother high and low, scoured the nearby hills and hollows. Finally, I kicked over a pile of human bones deep in a thicket. Couldn't tell whether they belonged to him or not. Hacked and charred too badly. Reminded me of something. I buried the bones and said a few words in case the gods were watching. 
Reinvention and a newfound loathing for travel served me well. I put my faith in the fates, relegated miseries to the past, and set to work. Strong whiskey and back-breaking labor kept me on the straight path and with scant time for contemplation on matters best left undisturbed. Soon I became an accomplished logger and attracted a crew of strapping lads. As you can see, riches did not follow. Nonetheless, we did well enough. I was content to dwell here in this cottage alone for a score of years. Over the years, I sought out Dandy Hurt and the others and introduced myself unto this new identity. Never did I choose to wander, however, nor did I pine for the company of a wife. Not until I met your mother in King's Grove by happy accident. <laughs> Charm, wit, beauty, youth. Too good for a woodcutter with white in his mane and sap in his beard, I vow. She smote me with a bat of her lashes. Long after our honeymoon, I harbored the notion she'd merely taken pity on a poor boy. In hindsight, it's more likely she fled demons of her own. City life is as treacherous as any bad stretch of forest. Eventually, you came along, my dear. Our only child. Despite an abundance of joy, I occasionally dreamed of death. And of things worse than death. The second time, I... I died, it was on a midsummer's night, nine years gone. Like my father before me, I chopped a tree and it corkscrewed beyond control and crushed me to jelly. You and your mother wept, then she disappeared. I imagine how it went. A strangled cry jolted you from nightmares. Though you desperately searched this hut, Though you combed the yard and woods, you discovered nary hide nor hair of her. You collapsed near the hearth, ashes in despair. Calamity upon calamity, what would become of you? But three nights later, you opened this door to soft knocking and found me, naked and delirious upon your step. I claim to be your uncle. What choice did you have other than accept providence? Parents dead or missing, no man to protect you, no man to provide. A girl alone in the wood is easy prey for beasts. Besides, there could be no question of our kinship. I am inalienably a rock. Sad to say, I'm also a wee bit more than that. This second death had traversed a similar arc to the first. I envisioned an abyss of terrible cold and darkness. I floated a stream as a fingerling babe upon a half-shell, and was devoured alive by bitterns. I clawed back into this world in the bog just yonder, the only real difference being my transformation from toddler to greybeard occurred as I stumbled along the path to your door. You accepted me and my hastily contrived tale of a prodigal uncle home at last. Robbers stripped me and left me beaten bloody. By the grace of the gods had I managed to reach sanctuary. The moment I learned of your mother's disappearance, I finally possessed an inkling of the horrible nature of the black eggs, if not their unholy provenance. Once a man departs the mortal realm, he can only be restored by the subtraction of another soul. Rebirth via the egg claimed the flesh and blood, and very consciousness of those whom I cherished. My suspicions were confirmed when I located her skeleton in the blackberry tangles that border the meadow. My wails of anguish scattered birds from the trees. A dark cloud blotted the sun, and rain lashed the field. Full to the crawl with dread, I went to the bog that twice vomited me forth and beheld the remnants of the obsidian eggs. Animals steer well clear of that plot. Pieces of broken shell lay there, perfectly preserved. After a bit of rooting around the bed of decayed leaves and mossy loam, I uncovered the third egg. 
It nestled in a patch of muck, glittering like a flinty gemstone prized free of the Dark Lord's own tiara. Gods help me. I intended to destroy the egg lest you one day feed its unnatural hunger. I failed. Each time I bore the egg away, it slipped from my pocket and reappeared in the bog by some malignant supernatural trickery. I kicked it, smashed it with my axe, piled tinderwood atop and set it ablaze. All useless. No measure so much as scratched the god's damned egg. I even resorted to prayer, if you can imagine your old man upon his knees, yammering to the invisible powers with the zeal of a penitent. What a farce. Despite these theatrics, a small voice in my head was pleased. My soul and my thoughts are corrupted, you see. To eat of the black egg is to be damned. Both times I've rode back from the abyss, my essence mingled and consumed an innocent, sacrificial soul. In the process, some essential piece of my own being was replaced. Cold and darkness seeped into my bones, that cruelly selfish portion bid me to quit my attempts to destroy the egg, and speak of it no more. I promised to ease my nightmares, I swore I would forget, but only if I played the fool, the supplicant, to my everlasting shame. I heeded this whisper, grateful as a dog for the whipping to end. Light burn me, I tried to be a good father. Once in a blue moon, I ignored my instincts and summoned the courage to perform one last valorous deed before the bell tolls an accounting. Perhaps John Foote's dark magic could reverse this damnation. Too bad he's dead and beyond the reach of all men. The names he mentioned, Julie, Ethan, Phil Wary, are the mysteries that confound solution. With rare exceptions, sorcerers tend to keep a low profile. There have been times, such as last night, fortified by loneliness for your mother, or by the powerful spirit of the jug, that I crept out to the bog and sat cross-legged in the moss, and schemed of ways to slip this noose around our necks. Generally, though, it's much easier to live the life of a garrulous drunkard and cheerfully wait for fate to run its course. Yes, so much easier to not dream of bitterns pecking my eyes and balls for eternity. Soon I shall die. Then I shall return. And you will be gone. You will vanish as my brother and your mother did. After you, there is no one. I will reside here, an unfamiliar ghost of myself, alone. He slumped against his pillow. The effort of reciting his tale of woe had drained the man and turned his flesh a chalky white. Bruises around his eyes and nostrils lent him the aspect of a corpse about to endure ritual mummification. He coughed. Blood speckled his beard. The woman held his hand. The fire had burnt low, casting a shadow across her face. She said, Uncle, I mean, duh, that was an amazing story, especially the part about John Foote. Did you really meet him? Was he so very ordinary? Surely you never met him. Merciful, did you listen to a word? You are a sweet, confused sod. Fret not over damnation, nor curses, nor phantoms. I ate the egg. You what? We ate the egg, to speak true. Did you suppose I slept through your blundering around the cottage at all hours? What matter to follow you? And what matter after you come and gone to examine the item you coveted in your favorite state? A great white goose egg. 
pristine as snow, awaiting my eager hands to pluck it from the nest. Pluck it I did, plop into my apron and borne home in a triss. No. Horror twisted his countenance. He covered his mouth against a deeper, ripping cough, and blood came freely between his fingers. Oh, daughter, there are no geese here. No geese. Nothing lives in the bog. Our luck was good, she said with placid determination. The omelet we enjoyed this morning contained rich red yolk and a lump of half-formed gosling to boot. Praise to the light. It is the first meat we've eaten since you took ill. He moaned and tossed his head in terrible negation. The woman stroked his brow. She soothed him until he ceased thrashing. His breathing slowed. After a long while, it stopped. She squeezed his hand. How sad it was to lose one's sanity with age as one lost his or her teeth. She wiped her eyes and composed herself. There were practical matters to attend, such as acquiring a husband to chop wood and hunt game and run off the ever-lurking bandits. Pickings were slim in this neck of the woods, so she'd long delayed accepting a suitor. Now she feared it would come down to one of the inbred Slauson brothers or a gap-toothed hick from among the Smythes who dwelt a couple hollows over. The dog growled. His mangy fur stiffened until he was more porcupine than mutt. The woman told him to be still, and then the shake roof peeled away with a grinding clatter. The stars were gone, replaced by a sky that glowed hellish red. A bittern, as tall and wide as a windmill, warbled mightily and slithered its long neck and broad sword of a bill through the gap and skewered the man's corpse, lifted him on high, and flicked him back down its throat. A second bird echoed the hunting cry and muscled in, its smooth, dark eye glinting with the murderous crimson light of the firmament. Well, shit, the woman said. The black bill unhinged as it plunged to take her. Gradually, the swollen red light dimmed and stars sprinkled the heavens. The dog waited until he hadn't heard any more screams of those piss-inducing bird cries for a while. He crept from beneath the table and sniffed around warily. Cold hearth. Empty beds. No humans but for their fading sense. Tragic. Although the mongrel had only wandered into the yard that spring, scraps were less than plentiful of late, and the woodcutter had been free with his hobnail boot after a few drinks, so the dog wasn't overly invested in the arrangement. He jumped through the open window and trotted away into the night. Years later, three kids, two boys and a girl, from down the path to King's Grove, spent the night in the haunted ruins of the cottage on a dare. There'd been stories. The girl got knocked up and married one of the boys. The third wheel, who'd been sweet on the girl, sulked and plotted vengeance against the happy couple. He ran away from home and eventually found himself in the company of a smarmy, silver-haired magician named Phil Wary. The pair traveled together from spring into late autumn. Wary relished having a handsome young pack mule at his beck and call. He promised to apprentice his strapping friend in the ways of the occult. Over a campfire supper, the boy mentioned to Wary the legend of the woodcutter's hut that originated from the wild tales the logger had sometimes shared with his fellow drunks at the tavern. The lad knocked back a mug of wine and laughed at how he'd spent the night at the cottage and dreamed the craziest dreams of monstrous birds and stone eggs. Phil Wary chuckled and poured them both another round. The boy sank into inebriated slumber. Upon his first snore, Wary cut his throat with an obsidian dagger. The magician gathered his belongings and walked briskly north into the mountains. Nobody saw him again for quite a while.
You've been listening to A Clutch by Arthur Laird Barron. Unfortunately for our hero, life in the Dark Ages was nasty, brutish, and not nearly short enough. <laughs> I'd like to personally thank you for joining me for this episode of Horror Hill. Don't forget to tune in again next week, when I yet again regale you with a handful of tales to terrify, plumbed from the most depraved depths of the human imagination. Tonight's episode featured tales from the very talented Sauron Narnia and Laird Baron. Army was written by and brought to you courtesy of Sauron Narnia. Sauron is the author of and the creator of the acclaimed Knife Point Horror Podcast and the author of all of the tales featured on his program. He also writes audiobooks collected in the podcast, Those Snowy Nights You Read to Me. They'll never be forgotten. And his collected works can be found on Amazon as well. When he's not writing, you'll find him wandering the cafes of Washington, D.C. For more information, visit his official website at sarinonia.com. A Clutch was written by and brought to you courtesy of Laird Barron. Laird was born in Alaska, where he raised huskies and worked in the construction and fishing industries for much of his youth. He is the author of several short story collections and several novels, including The Imago Sequence and Other Stories, Swift to Chase, and Blood Standard. And his work has also appeared in many magazines and anthologies. A multiple Locus, World Fantasy, and Bram Stoker Award nominee, he is also a three-time winner of the Shirley Jackson Award. Currently, Baron lives in the Rondout Valley of New York State and is at work on tales about the evil that men do. For more information, visit his official blog at lairdbaron.wordpress.com. That's Laird, spelled L-A-I-R-D, Baron, B-A-R-R-O-N, dot wordpress, dot com. Or... Follow him on Facebook and Twitter to get his latest updates. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page, or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts, and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference, and it would mean a lot to me. If you'd like to hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program, all of our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Thanks so much for your time and for giving our sponsors a try today. When you support our sponsors, you help support the show, and that means a lot to me. Until next week, listener, when we meet up once again atop the horror hill for yet another dance with darkness, I bid you good night, sleep tight, listener, and whatever you do, if you hear scratching at your door, don't open it. The darkness may have found you, but it's up to you to let it in. <laughs>
and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Jason Hill. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Felipe Ojeda, Luke Hodgkinson, and Jesse Cornett. Final mixing and mastering by executive producer and director Craig Groshak. The program's artwork by yours truly, Jason Hill. Logo by Craig Groshak. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you like performed? I take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your work considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on social media to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and our other programs. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for Chilling Tales for Dark Nights as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit the thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you're after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. (laughs) 